Hello, everyone. Surprise. You are in the holiday mood. And we are here to discuss some very serious issues with you. That will really mark the end of this year and give us some directions for the next year. As you know from the title of the video of the session, this is about the upcoming syllabus change in NTNet. NTNet is like an objective correlative because it is reflecting these changes that are going to happen are reflecting a lot of changes and paradigm shifts that have happened in the academia and that are still happening. So are you up for a discussion? We have here with us two guests. One is Mr. J.S. Anandakrishnan. Anandakrishnan is a senior research fellow at the Department of English at the Sri Shankara University of Sanskrit, Kaladi. He's in the fag end of his research. He's going to submit his dissertation. And he is, uh, at the same time, he has been doing a lot of other things too. He is one of the upcoming uh, experts in the upcoming area of uh, artificial intelligence and also digital aesthetics. We all know about AI art by now. And uh, digital aesthetics is also developing along with it. He talks about very many different aspects of digital humanities in his seminars and talks. Hey, he has also written quite a large number of books. He's the author of nine books. And uh, he had a brilliant educational career. Uh, he was the awardee of Prime Minister's UA Fellowship. As all of us, he has also uh, prepared for the civil services exam, which has given like all of anybody who prepares for it knows what it gives you is a solid knowledge background. So Ananda Krishnan is one of our guests. Welcome to the session. The next is Roy. You might have seen him already. He is a core member of the team Valat. He joined Valat many years ago as a student. And then again, as a student, 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 <laughs> And then he became a content developer and tutor. And he's a very popular one at that. And after I met him, he had the rest of his brilliant educational career because he joined the Hyderabad Central University for his MA. And recently he has finished it. He is into research in queer studies and environmental humanities. So what our guests today are experts in are the various aspects of cultural studies. Before I move on to them and listen to their views, let us look at the uh, an overview of uh, what is happening in our academics these days. You know that national eligibility test is changing right at the time when NEP 2020 is going to be implemented. Our degree courses are going to be revamped. Research, MA, everything is changing. What is the key element? What are the key features of the NEP syllabus? As all of us know, there are lots of brilliant things there. It is up to us and to all the people in the academia to implement it effectively. What are the aims? One is interdisciplinarity. Multidisciplinarity has given us a very key value of education here. And no more mugging up theories and uh, not being able to do any job. That was the scenario some time ago. We then focused on life skills. And now the usability of your knowledge, the competence that you will get in a profession that is given more and more and more importance. You might know that NEP focuses on inclusivity a lot. All the diverse cultures of India, all the people with different capabilities, everybody has to be included. So that is reflected in the syllabus also. Equality, equitability, holistic education, all these have become important. So uh, Roy 
you being an expert in queer studies, how do you see this change? Uh, what are the changes that you have noticed in the syllabi, in the uh, exams patterns? Has it really become more inclusive? Is it something that we are looking forward to in 2024 as well? Yes, indeed. On, on a positive note, it's good that we are, you know, we are becoming more inclusive by paying more attention to the local as opposed to the global, which is not prioritizing one over the other. But to understand the global better, you need to have a good knowledge of the local and vice versa. To give you an example from queer studies, you know, we are all familiar with the Western concept of the transsexual, somebody who tries to transcend the uh, binaries of sex. But, you know, many of us do not know that the Indian, you know, the Indian counterpart of the transsexual, for example, the hijra, it is, you know, some of us think of it as a slur word, but it's actually our own culture's reinterpretation or different interpretation of a Western concept, which was, which we had arguably way before the transsexual emerged as a theoretical concept. So, you know, while it's good that we pay attention to other cultures, to the West and what they are doing in these fields, but at the same time, we should have uh, some knowledge of our own, you know, our own traditions, our own belief systems and what output we have produced because uh, one, because it helps in our own, it helps in, in improving the quality of our output, our research output. And secondly, because people abroad are more interested in what you know, other than let's say English literature or other than the canonical areas, quote unquote. Right. Roy has been uh, working hard to submit his PhD applications to various international universities. Let's hope he gets through. We'll come to what the international universities look for. But since you mentioned Indian traditions, we all know that that's a very important element in NEP and our syllabi and exams. And here, right here, we have Ananda Krishnan, who has written a lot of books on Malayalam literature and culture. And uh, he has studied Indian culture in different ways. And his wife is also working on similar areas. So Ananda Krishnan, what do you think of the inclusion of Indian traditions? It is not only the Sanskritic traditions, but Dalit traditions, the regional uh, comparative literatures and regional literatures of India, everything is there. How do you see this change? You know, it, you the last few years, you have seen a sea change in the way, the perspectives in which, uh, you know, India has been asking its participants, its, you know, the, the uh, students, the aspirants, uh, for example, even in the last revision, we saw the addition of topics, uh, you know, as topics, uh, uh, post-colonial literature or cultural studies. But the most important part for me was the inclusion of the, an Indian outlook as far as syllabus is concerned. So from now on, I think there'll be more focusing on the Indian aspects of literature. For example, if you go with adaptation studies, you have mentioned my wife. She has worked on uh, Kathakali and its adaptations of Shakespeare. So in the last few years, we've been tracking uh, the Indian literature. I mean, I'm putting it very straight, Indian literature and not Indian English literature. So Indian literature is getting a new focus, uh, a revitalized focus right now in NTA net for English. So we are not just focusing on Indian English literature as seen earlier. So you can't anymore just stick on to Iyengar's text, for example, yeah. uh, you know, which is prescribed you know mm -hmm. which has been prescribed the last few years for in, in you know in TA net now you will have to be more open see what is happening around you for the example uh, the last few years Asian literature most of the awards uh, uh, in Asian literature uh, you know goes for translations from Indian languages a, a common trend over the last five years in particular so our literature is getting focused even abroad right now so we um, obviously we I mean we dominate the earth's population all right now so obviously the focus should be there for, but for us when we are another spotlight in the exams will also be focusing on the indian context and the national educational policy and the ncf clearly uh, demarcates this that we will be focusing more on the indian perspectives rather than the earlier uh, you know, uh, more British context that we obviously had before regarding uh, English literature. So uh, we can expect a revamp. Now, uh, the, uh, by middle of Jan, I think the new framework will be out for us, uh, for, for the NDA net as well. So uh, there will be changes. Uh, wow. But this is predictable. Yeah. Yeah. 
there are a few points in what uh, Ananda Krishnan said that really struck me. One is that we can expect a change in January itself. Our upcoming course that is starting on January 8th is taking into consideration a lot of these changes. We are collecting material, a team of content developers, including Roy. We are all at it revamping our uh, you know our own syllabi here syllabus here and our encyclopedias new ones are coming out indian encyclopedia is coming out this month mm, and uh, the second thing that i uh, mentioned when you said it is uh, when you talked this uh, the importance of publishing translation and publishing we know that gitanjali shri or manu espilla etc have become internationally famous so we have to focus on such writers also now we have to include them in our uh, content in our uh, classes which at valat we are going to do and also focus on many many important uh, critics indian critics maybe whom we did not look at very seriously till now G and Devi, for example or kunjuni raja who has written about uh, sanskritic traditions for example and uh, when you thought about talked about publishing i just remembered there are so many things uh, that we don't really look at again which are important for example copyright laws or intellectual property rights i saw that these are included in some syllabi yes roy what do you think of that you know we should also have an idea of who are the mainstream and alternative publishers in india for example i don't know how many students know westland books Zuban books, etc. These books publish academic content, relevant academic content on India, India studies, Indian literature, so on and so forth that, you know, they are taking like, they do it at their own risk, their own expense, because some of these books we know, unfortunately, do not get the attention that they deserve when it comes to the to the popular market. So, you know, Zuban books particularly, it's run by Urvashi Bhutalia. Uh, she has even collaborated with Oxford University Press. So, uh, you know, we should have a knowledge of institutions like that and what they do, how they contribute to the country's knowledge uh, repository, as well as the risks and the, the challenges that publishers have to face. Uh, you know, just like critics, just like authors, editors, publishers are also part and parcel of the literature, let's say, that, you know, uh, paraphernalia. Yeah, yeah. That, and uh, yes, another question. Adding to what uh, Roy said, uh, he was talking about the publishers, knowing them around, but uh, one word uh, which uh, which is quite important is national. When uh, you you will have to now think about one more perspective that could be you know uh, you know very interesting to note would be the national struggle for independence. So uh, as NEP clearly states about understanding India's struggle for independence. We have actually left out that large corpus of literature that was published during the period of colonial struggle. So now when we are looking at colonization or, or, or we are thinking about, uh, I mean, the colonial studies, we will not focus on, we, I mean, as of now, we focus on African literature and the Africa's you know, writing back to the empire from Africa and continent in particular. And even when you're talking about uh, the Indian context, we are talking only about the theorists in particular. Uh, for example, when we talk about Baba, uh, we will be talking it from the pure theoretical perspective. Now we'll have to look at it from the perspective of literature produced during the freedom uh, struggle. And adding one more point, uh, ma'am, you said that the next, I mean, batch will be, uh, you know, uh, uh, from Jan 8, if I'm right, yeah, yeah, I heard it right. That would be the perfect time to start because uh, if you've seen that circular issued by NTA, you might have noticed that there will be at least three to four months for for the uh, you know the uh, aspirants themselves to respond back to see what changes can be included. So whatever you get in Jan won't be the final part. So even if you are a group of students who are preparing together right from Jan middle. So we'll get enough time to discuss and we can tell them whether we are okay with the structure that they are giving or is there any problem or is this exceptional? So we'll have enough time to brainstorm if we start pretty early. We are starting not after the preparation of the final syllabus, but at the very stage of preparation. So Jan 8 would be particularly impressive. Best thing, they will anyway be trimming down what is being published on Jan 8. So yes. what we will encounter would be the entire corpus of the syllabus. So it, the preparations will be comprehensive if you start by Jan 8. Yes, I, I yes. think that is the best part here. 
So we start on January 8th. Uh, we will do a foundational uh, course. By then, the we should get an idea of the syllabus. Then uh, our team, you know, with our students can devise uh, our ideas on it and we can uh, get back to them, uh, you know, according to how they want us to do it. All over India, people will be doing that anyway. Amazing, amazing. Now, as you were speaking, both of you, in fact, I uh, stumbled upon a very, very important aspect of the syllabus revision that we can expect. Uh, today, we are not looking at traditional theory uh, of Derrida, Lacan, Foucault, like that. But uh, theory has taken on a new philosophical and historical perspective. Um, theory of the minorities, theory, you know, of the of disability or, or queer studies, uh, of biopower, so many uh, studies have emerged, hundreds of studies have emerged within cultural studies. Uh, and there will, there will be a focus on these, I expect, uh, rather than general literary theory as a topic. For example, I have myself listed down a few here. Some of them are old, we already know about them, like life writing, uh, media and film studies, uh, popular culture, gender and queer can be avoided, disability, uh, but maybe digital humanities, food, biopolitics, trauma, ecology, environment is a very important aspect of uh, NEP, I noticed. Then urban culture, when it comes to language, it may not be the traditional ELT anymore, but uh, language with a more philosophical focus and also a performative focus, language of communication, language, uh, uh, you know, the theories of uh, performative or pragmatic aspects, all these things may be important. And also internationally, there are some uh, areas that are important, like social response, uh, reproduction. Recently, we had a lecture from a scholar in UK on social reproduction theories. Uh, then uh, disposability, livability, precarity, all those new amazing theories. Uh, I, I think all these could be expected, at least in some combination, to some extent. Uh, I think this general nature of the syllabus that it, that was itself oppressive till now. We did not know what theories they will ask, what authors they will ask. I think that might change and there will be more focus on some of these because recently in AP PSC syllabus, I saw that disability studies is a unit in itself. Uh, so that is becoming very, very important. What do you think, Roy? Is it is that the focus in central universities right now? Is it how it is? Yes, that, that is very much the case because, you know, uh, when, when I'm quoting Pramod Nayar here, uh, he's, he said that in literary theory, there seems to be everything except the literary because theory is a very vast field. You know, we explore discipline after discipline. So ideally, we should also, we should not stay with the, let's say, uh, as you mentioned, the quote unquote traditional theories that we are familiar with. You know, we should go beyond. We should see what the world is doing, what the world is interested in. As you mentioned, oh, okay. Since you said Ramut Nair sir's name, I would also want you to reflect on his take and your Central University take on research methodology. That's also becoming very important. Yes, you know, uh, I will, I will. Uh, uh, as, as I was saying, you know, uh, when it comes to disability studies, for example, how how the world has, you know, designed itself, how the urban space as well as the rural semi-urban spaces have designed themselves in a way that is not convenient for a differently abled person to traverse or to survive in, for example. And when it comes to digital humanities, let's say, you know, many people are afraid of exploring these areas because they think, you know, it's very complex, very complicated, erudite kind of thing. But digital humanities is actually not all about these hi-fi gadgets, hacking, etc. A large part of digital humanities also involves very creative, very productive work that is done by things as basic as a spreadsheet. You know, as, as basic as MS Excel, for example. And when it comes to methodology, uh, I am going to quote the example of the sciences. In the sciences, if you want to publish in a major journal, let's say like nature, if you mention one word in your research book or article, that word has to mean the same, even if it's used a hundred times. Sciences are that rigorous in their methodology. This is something that we should also imbibe. You know, every literature student, no matter at what level of her, uh, you know, scholarship or career, should make sure that methodology is the one thing that you do not miss out on. And it is not just for the sake of this exam. Methodology is, you know, it's like lifeblood for a scholar. That is what I would say. All right. Now that you uh, touched upon digital humanities, Ananda Krishnan, you are the right person here to talk about the importance of digital humanities and artificial intelligence in both NTNet as well as in research. Please tell enlighten us about it. 
uh, digital humanities, as Roy said, I mean, there is an exact quote from uh, Professor Stuart Russell from uh, MIT uh, when he said that digital humanities itself is not an academic discipline, but rather a methodology of uh, approaching humanities. Uh, it can, you know, it was started very early in 2003 itself uh, when you saw this wonderful book uh, called uh, Trees, Maps, and Graphs, where uh, the author Franco Moretti started uh, graphically representing by exploration of sheer raw data. He has created a digital history of English novels. So that uh, happened way earlier, 20 years before, and we have started talking about digital humanities in detail in 2023. So this happened 20 years before the, the iconic text as far as uh, uh, digital humanities is concerned. Now, as, as far as the current uh, status is uh, concerned, what, what we can think about will be the ethical part as far as NTA net is concerned. So when we encountered our earlier uh, courseworks, which I have also done, you, you have done, Roy, I think you'll be doing it again. If you have done your MVD, you might have already gone through that. So the ethical part will be revised right now. So when AI tools are into that, now it's in the game and uh, you can see automation in a never before seen, uh, you know, uh, uh, an amount. I mean, Roy, I'd also like to add one more point that uh, you were, you're talking about the, uh, the compliance regarding certain publishers when you're publishing your articles. Uh, trust me, there are artificial intelligence powered applications which can actually restructure the entire research paper to uh, you know adjust itself to that particular publisher by by going through the publishers articles even in the range of 20 years trust me restructuring your paper by analyzing papers around I mean, published in that particular journal that are almost about 20 years so they'll be restructuring your entire paper with abstract keywords, et cetera. There will be ethical problems and these ethical problems will be what, uh, you know, which will be encountered in the coming exam. So AI and ethics will be a major area uh, for us to assess Roy soon. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. You know, uh, and to add to your point, you know, digital humanities has been, you know, it has been implemented or deployed for use after use a, a very recent article that i came across it it, it it debunks a myth that many of us have that emily dickinson is a gloomy poet you know mm -hmm. just because she was reclusive we associate that with being gloomy you, know, you can't be happy because you're when you're alone right that that is what we think but what this project does is it counts the number of positive words used in dickinson's over and their frequency and it also counts the number of negative words and it says look she has used positive words. She has used happy words way many more times than she has used negative sounding words. This thing can be proved, you know, it can be proved statistically only by a machine or a digital, uh, you know, methodology. <laughs> uh, this is a very uh, important field right now. Actually, they're trying to automate biography by, I mean, this also falls under my discipline. That's why it just came in. Uh, there is a fair amount of research going on just by analyzing the corpus of a person's work. You are trying to create the biography out of the work, the emotional aspects as well as the psychological, rather the mindscape of the author is revealed through the works. Uh, Mr. Elliot uh, would differ, uh, but that's what is happening in the field of digital humanities. Right. So all along I have been telling students, you should do original reading, you should do original analysis, reading the text will never replace reading summaries. But here <laughs> we have total revolution in the field of digital humanities. But I think my uh, statement still counts. My advice still matters because we can't use AI in NTNet. We still have to use our brain. So how, what is what, what are your opinions? I think when we look at the question papers, actual reading of the books, actual analysis is very important, isn't it? Yes, you know, I'll take the example of queer studies now. Uh, you know, earlier they used to ask you, they, they will give you a few works by, let us say, Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick or Judith Butler or Oscar Wilde, and they say arrange this in chronological order. So you're supposed to have some idea which book came before the last one. It's not that easy. But now what they're doing is they're asking you analytical questions based on theories like performativity. So unless you clearly know, unless you can define in simple terms, look, this is what performativity is about. And you also have to know what it is not about, you know, because options can be misleading. 
you, you have to clearly know what it is about and what it is not about. Only then can you answer the questions that they are asking now. So we have this, you know, we have this wrong perception that when it comes to certain areas, unlike digital humanities, certain areas like environmental humanities, square studies, etc., we have this wrong perception that a superficial knowledge is all that is required. If you have a, a superficial knowledge about the major names, the major books, etc., you can survive, right? So uh, that is wrong. Yes, uh, I was also wondering if you could, you know, elaborate on what changes are going on in our new course. How are we recoursing to face <laughs> these things? That's a beautiful expression, recoursing. Uh, well, in a way, I was always getting ready for this change because always I used to tell our students, you should do original reading, you should know the text, you should know the style. What we are giving our students is the building blocks, the, the basic ideas of the concepts. There are a lot of people who uh, do self-learning. Self-learning is amazing, uh, but it will take some time to fall on track. Uh, if you have a little bit of guidance, uh, you, you can do it faster. Otherwise, you might detrack, uh, you know, detrain a little bit and you'll have to come back. So what we do is given usually an overview of all the milestones in literature, help people understand what is great about these writers or how to understand these concepts and motivate our students so much that they end up reading, they end up remembering. It is not a simple task. It is not easy. Uh, it takes time and it depends on your interest and the amount of time you put in. But um, I was always in this going in this direction only to some extent or to some degree. Um, now, when this change is imminent, and I'm expecting this change, there might be things uh, in the NTA syllabus that we have not predicted or we have not thought of, maybe yes, we have not talked about paper one, we'll come to that. Uh, but I am for sure I know that they want the students to know things thoroughly. They want the students to have a pretty good picture of the historical development of ideas. So that way I am not, I won't be surprised. We have been working on that. We have a huge amount of information collected. Uh, we have the largest database when it comes to English literature studies that a student requires. For sure, we have the largest database curated uh, in the country, at least, because for 25 years, as you know, Roy and Ananda Krishnan, our students, our team members, they were relentlessly doing this. So if you go to one place and you get everything that you need, at least an overview, that is our material and course for sure. I can say this confidently, but way, way more work is remaining. So much more is to be done. Today also, we are excitedly working on our new uh, books. There are many new books coming in. One book on research ethics is uh, being worked on. Uh, as you were speaking uh, about the pu publishers, I was thinking we should ask our team, maybe you yourself, to write a, or Ananda Krishnan also can help to write a monograph on uh, the contemporary publishers uh, in English from the purview of English literature and culture studies. What are the books that they have published? What, what, what do they stand for? Who are their founders? And what, what, you know, they're all activists most of the time. They're not just ordinary business people. So it is, I don't know whether such a book is there, but it's it's a wonderful idea. Uh, and they have been asking about dictionaries and, uh, you know, grammar books and so many things that do not come in the purview of a regular uh, English literature curriculum. But uh, I don't blame NTA because what NTA is doing most of the time is taking some very basic major books that are usually prescribed in syllabi in the secondary reading, etc., that everybody should know. They are such major books and they're asking simple questions from these books. So we have a reading list here. Uh, we have a huge library. We are following those books. Uh, that is why most of our students find our materials and classes very useful. So now coming to paper one, you know that paper one is very important and difficult for many students. And this time, uh, many students got a rude shock because there were some deep questions from uh, logical reasoning or data interpretation, etc. I think uh, Ananda Krishnan, ha, being a person who has prepared for the civil services, you are in the know of those things. Can you please enlighten us on what are the focus areas in uh, civil services, UPSC exams, and how has those focus areas been changing? Do you think logical reasoning and maths are going to be even more important? Can you please enlighten us on that? 
it will be uh, more focused on the analytical skills rather than the straight questions that are being asked. So even the, even the paper one would be more indirect in analytical. Uh, it's but the analytical questions are not so easy. Uh, you know, as we uh, have encountered earlier, you you not only have to know the facts, but you also have to get behind the scenes. Um, you will have to understand the why aspect as well. So uh, I mean. Often I've heard people talking about static questions and dynamic questions, but even in U whether it's UPSC or it, whether it is NTA, now there is no clear distinction between what is static and what is dynamic. And it, it's all mixed up and that is the surprise factor. So, and these changes, not just uh, accidental, you know, they want thinking people right now. It's not about just people who perform well in exams after mugging up things. And preparing for such exams also require experience. Uh, you are talking about AI. Uh, you know, AI can help you in a situation where there is no, as uh, Roy has put it, no recoursing. You know, there is no recoursing happening. But uh, this is too terrific. It's, it's, it's quite uh, analogous to what is happening with the stairwells in Harry Potter. So it keeps on moving, changing, leading you to the next corridor. It moves on and on. That is what is happening in net. So uh, coming back to the first paper, uh, it's a test of many things. Uh, knowledge is just a part of it. You also have the uh, analytical ability, decision-making skills for that matter, logical thinking. And even uh, to the extent of, uh, you know, uh, can, I mean, uh, finding out uh, the thinking human being from a group of one-dimensional machines, uh, and the change that they, you know, require from us when they uh, NTA requires from us would be, uh, you know, a shift from the traditional methods of learning, which obviously needs good assistance. So, and to read between the lines and understand what is happening around you. So rather than the bookish knowledge that we have been after in the last few years, they're also looking uh, from us a comprehensive understanding of what is happening around us. Uh, we'll have to curate it, obviously. We'll have to properly organize that particular learning experience. You know, uh, there is an order expected. Uh, it's not absolute anarchy. Uh, it's a competitive yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you can you can, uh, you can accept a pandemic, mean, like uh, expect a pandemonium there. Yeah, there yeah. will be order in the hell. Uh, so, uh, and that order the is what I madness. Think, yeah, Sorry. there will <laughs> Obviously. So uh, anyway, to avoid Hamiltonian dilemmas, I think Tess can, uh, you know, help you out there. So uh, I think uh, we'll yeah. be looking uh, for this analytical uh, thinking yes. human being from now on, rather than mugging it all up. Yes, Roy, over to you only. But please enlighten us on how, as a student who has passed this exam, how do you think the students should prepare paper one? What, what, should they take it lightly and just do some uh, practice questions before the exam? How? You know, uh, paper one is like fight club. You do not talk about paper one until the day before the exam. That should change. <laughs> you know, we should we 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 we, we should get uh, enough exposure to paper one. The more we get to know it, the less we have to fear it. And what I feel is, you know, paper one is basically, as Ananda Krishnan mentioned, analytical questions. So it's a kind of a translation job. Let's say you have to translate what the person is trying to tell you in the question to a language that can then be broken down. If it's mathematics, it's as simple as writing an equation. Once you write the equation, half the job is done. Then you just have to solve it. And calculation errors are human. So we understand, you know, so uh, I, not just the max part, you know, in the paper one part, other than the general knowledge questions that some of the questions that we may be entirely unfamiliar with, all the other questions, even if we may not exactly know the answer, by analyzing the question, we can at least eliminate a few options that goes a long way towards answering the question. You know, every bit of progress counts. And I also wanted to add, um, as uh, ma'am, you had asked me earlier, you know, what is my institution interested in right now? Uh, this is something I'm proud to announce. We have started the only national resource only national peer-reviewed resource in Indian writing in English. It's called IWE Online. We have our own channel as well as our own YouTube, uh, you know, channel which has more than forty videos, uh, forty videos in which both national and international academics talk about relevant topics. It's entirely free of cost, and our website also contains several works, critical as well as creative, in original. All of that content is peer reviewed. So I would recommend everybody to check it out. It's IWE online for Indian writing in English by University of Hyderabad. Great. Wow. 
So yes, Anand Krishnan. Before yeah, we wind just, up, yeah, yeah, just to add to the paper one part. Obviously, we make this mistake of uh, skipping out those difficult questions. You know, while preparing for the EDC uh, paper one, we usually usually skip all the difficult questions. And I know we are narcissistic in uh, many ways. This is one way of doing it, especially if you are from literature. Uh, and for that pleasure, we'll be leaving them and we'll be focusing on that comfy zone, uh, you know. So what I think uh, net, perhaps, perhaps the key of cracking it all comes, uh, you know, right uh, after your breakfast. You know, when you go for your paper one, uh, you know, uh, I think I think uh, they have put it there purposefully, you know, be healthy uh, uh, so that you can, you know, face a paper one and be at ease you know the rest is silence so uh face your paper one like i think uh, more focus should be put uh, in on paper one and in yeah, another so... informal conversation i had with ananda krishnan he was uh telling me that you should not take even comprehension questions lightly there are some techniques with which you can read and uh, so i have invited him over to deliver a lecture to our students so that they will get to know better ways of tackling even comprehension. Yes, Roy. You know, we are about to wind up, but what I wanted to say, just to add your point, you know, in the comprehension question, they are giving you, they are showing you the answer. So there will obviously be a trap. If they want you to feel overconfident, they want you to underestimate the question because look, the answer is here. You feel like you got it, but I, I, I trust, you know, trust me on this. Many of the questions they ask in the comprehension aspect of paper one are difficult. That's why they ask it at the end when you must have, you know, you feel like, okay, I finished the difficult question. Now let me go on to the comprehension. Do not make that mistake. The comprehension part is treacherous. Trust me. <laughs> it is a mind. Wow. Uh, well, that is not to frighten you guys. Uh, it only takes the right approach, the right strategy and right practice. So if you're interested in joining our courses, obviously, you know what to do. Uh, you can check out at our Valat website and uh, you can uh, join before it's too late. Right now, there is a discount going on. Uh, but even if you do not join the course, no problems. Uh, just follow these tips and uh, prepare, you know, in the right direction, in the right way. Many, many people have uh, cleared with their hard work and persistent efforts. So you can do that too. I'm very, very hopeful, like my, our guests here, I'm also very hopeful that uh, NEP will bring a wonderful uh, future. There'll be so many possibilities and opportunities opening out in front of us. There will be mines and pitfalls too. I mean, no opportunity comes uh, like a bed of roses. It will have its thorns too. There will be problems too. But we should be able to circumvent it, solve the problems and move ahead. We are there to help you if you need us. Thank you very much, Roy and Ananda Krishnan, for talking to our uh, amazing YouTube babies. They are every day looking forward to our uh, productive videos. So I hope you will join us again for more fruitful discussions. Thank you. Good night.